Hello, I'm Randa Darwish. This presentation is about clinical guide for management of pediatric patients during the corona pandemic. Medical analysis-based studies show that children are not the frontline cases for COVID-19, with a prevalence of 0.9% in early childhood and 1.2% in later childhood and adolescence. Children at a higher risk for having the infection include long-term respiratory conditions as chronic lung disease of prematurity with oxygen dependency, cystic fibrosis, severe asthma, and respiratory complications of neurodisability. Immunodeficiency is a risk factor also, including treatment for malignancies, congenital immunodeficiencies, Immunosuppressive medications, including long-term treatment, either oral or IV steroids. Alternate days therapy is not a risk factor. Post-transplant patients and asplenia. Hemodynamically significant and or cyanotic heart disease are also risk factors. Chronic kidney disease, stages 4, 5 or on dialysis. There's no evidence that children and young people with type 1 diabetes are at a higher risk. For pediatric good practice, we need to follow the public health guidance, use telemedicine, plan for stopping elective procedures and treatments that may consume critical care and ward resources, plan for increasing capacity for oxygen and ventilators, infection control measures with appropriate personal protection equipment. Training should include also simulation. All hospitals and health systems should collaborate in the face of this pandemic. Only clinically essential face-to-face -face meetings should occur. The telephone or video conferencing may also be utilized when available to carry out consultation with patients and their family when clinically necessary. So what the doctor has to consider is that remote consultations, whether online, via telephone, or video link, can improve the patient access to advice and treatment, but they are not always an appropriate alternative to seeing the patient face to face. So when consulting remotely, it's important to consider the limitations of the medium by which you are communicating with the patient. You should not prescribe unless you are satisfied that you have sufficient information to do so safely. You have to weigh up several factors to decide what type of consultation you will give. Remote consultations are appropriate when the patient's clinical needs are straightforward, you have all the information you need, you have a safe system to prescribe, you have access to the patient's medical records, so you don't need to examine the patient. And the patient has the capacity to decide about the treatment. Face-to-face -face consultations are preferred when the patient has complex clinical needs and is at a higher risk. You do not have access to the patient's medical records and you don't have enough information. Also, if you are not the patient's usual doctor or GP, so you need to examine the patient. You are unsure of the patient's capacity to decide about treatment. Injectable cosmetic products are not prescribed online. When preparing for an assessment, you have to implement infection control measures. Assess individuals in a single occupancy room. Wear personal protective equipment. As a minimum, this should be a fluid-resistant surgical mask, single-use disposable apron, and gloves, and eye protection if blood or body fluid contamination to the eyes or face is anticipated. If a patient meeting the case definition undergoes an aerosol-generating procedure, then a special respirator should be used. Long-sleeved disposable fluid-repellent gown, gloves, and eye protection must be worn. Refer to your local infection control measures. Ask the patient to wear a surgical face mask while transporting them to the single room or isolation area. 
In the pandemic, a possible COVID-19 case is defined as an individual who has clinical or radiological evidence of pneumonia, acute respiratory distress, or a flu-like illness. For children with suspected COVID-19 infection in the community settings, clinicians should use their professional judgment to decide whether to total or self-isolate the children. They should also consider whether visits are necessary. If so, is telemedicine applicable or face-to-face -face visits are more needed? When considering whether visits should be conducted as planned, clinicians should also consider their own safety and the safety of the other children that they provide care for. So if a clinician believes they have become infected with COVID-19, they should self-isolate. Recent guidelines state that oropharynx of children should only be examined if essential. If the throat needs to be examined, personal protective equipment should be worn, irrespective of whether the child has symptoms consistent with COVID-19 or not. These are the guidelines for the household's isolation regimen. It's based on that the incubation period has a maximum of 14 days. Day one is the first day of symptoms of the case. The 14 days period starts from the day when the first person in the house became ill. So if someone becomes ill, he should self isolate for seven days and the whole house or the whole family self isolates for 14 days. In the emergency department, if a child with possible COVID-19 presents directly to the emergency department, they should be redirected to your local COVID-19 isolation area in the hospital. If the child has severe respiratory compromise, management is done in a specialized isolated cubicle. A record should be kept of all staff in contact with a possible case, and this record should be accessible to the occupational health should the need arise. Healthcare staff should wear personal protective equipment and these should be disposed according to the infection control procedures. Basic and advanced life resuscitation should be performed for the case. Pediatric critical care describes the care of children who need an advanced level of observation, monitoring or intervention, which cannot be done safely or delivered in general wards. It's divided according to the level of severity and accordingly to the modes of management into several levels. Level one is the basic critical care. Level two, the intermediate critical care. Level three, which is the advanced critical care, is further subdivided into five groups. Advanced one, three, four, and five, where the extracorporeal membrane oxygenation is needed. These are the major headlines for an admitted patient. Isolation, sampling and testing, reporting to the authorities, management and discharge of patients. This is a flow diagram for the management of critically ill children with suspected COVID-19. For critically ill children, the level of pediatric critical care is decided. For level one, oxygen is given and the patient sits in an isolated room waiting for the results. If confirmed, then the algorithm of confirmed cases is followed. For critically ill children, they are transported to the specialized critical care room. Management is performed awaiting for the result. And this room is also under isolation. For level three, the appropriate advanced management is performed also, and the patient is transferred to a specialized room where the essential medical treatment is given, awaiting also for the results. For non-critically ill children, they are isolated according to their degree of suspicion. They are either self-isolated or isolated in a special cubicle in the hospital, and 
the results are awaited. Ill children with confirmed COVID-19 infection are transferred to specialized isolation centers and they are managed there according to their degree of manifestations. If they are non-critically ill or critically ill, and if they are critically ill according to their degree of severity, whether level one who need high flow nasal cannula therapy, level two non-invasive ventilation, for example, a CPAP, and level three who may require invasive ventilation. This is the negative pressure isolation room. This is an example of it. For admitted children, we need to follow good practice principles. Reassure the patients. Most children will have much milder illness than is seen in adults. So reassure the children and parents as they are likely to be concerned from information and misinformation they hear. They might know an adult with an infection who may was treated with a different way and may have been severely unwell. You have to involve the parents. The way healthcare professionals communicate with families is important. When parents feel that they are away from their children and away from the discussions, they may become anxious and feel that their child is not being managed properly. Be vigilant. Some children with COVID-19 will develop complications and comorbidities. Be aware of local sepsis guidelines, acute kidney injuries, and respiratory failure guidelines. You must adhere to guidance around infection control. Be aware that these may change over time, so you have to be updated. Teamwork is very important. The whole multidisciplinary team must work together to ensure the best outcome for the child. And take care to minimize the spread of the virus in hospital. So be aware of local and national recommendations for doing this. Ideally, only one parent should accompany the child to isolation cubicle. Decide who will be there and let him know about all the precautions of self-isolation. Follow isolation plans as for admitted patients. The patient and all the family members should wear surgical masks while in the emergency department. And the attending parents must, must wear personal protective equipment at all times within the hospital buildings and grounds. It's not advisable to move suspected patients and their families internally throughout the hospital until an infection risk assessment is performed. This covers risk of family members being infected, risk of family members themselves being secondary infected by case, risk of family members infecting others within the hospital, and the management of an asymptomatic parent or carer who themselves be a potential infection risk when entering or exiting the, the unit. Alder Hay Children's Hospital and the British Pediatric Respiratory Society have developed guidance for the medical management of children with COVID-19. These include radiology, fluids, antipyretics, respiratory support, antibiotics, resp antiv antivirals, bronchodilators, systemic steroids, liver dysfunction management, and hydroxychloroquine. The management plan is set according to individual needs. It was found that 95% of people can go straight home on discharge. 50% can go home with minimal or no additional support. 45% can go home with a short or longer term support. And 5% of people will require residential or nursing care setting. When discharging a patient, the clinical team reviews these questions. Is the patient medically optimized? What management can be continued as ambulatory, example, if there is heart failure? What management can be continued outside the hospital with the community nurse, example, IV antibiotics? Can they be discharged with suitable follow-up? Is oxygen needs met at home? And repeat bloods, can be, they be done? when they are set home? Patients are waiting for investigations. Can they go home and come back 
as outpatients with the same waiting as inpatients. Both acute and community hospitals must discharge all patients as soon as they are clinically safe to do so. Transfer from the ward should happen within one hour of that decision to a designated discharge area. Discharge from hospital should happen as soon after that as possible, normally within two hours. To create a safety net and increase confidence in discharging, consider patient-initiated follow-up. Give patients a contact number. Telephone the following day after discharge to check and offer reassurance. Call them back with results and investigations and if there are any changes in the management plan. Bring them back under the same team and request community nursing follow-up for patients with specific needs. Public Health England recommendations for aerosol generating procedures state that procedures that produce aerosols of respiratory secretions, for example, bronchoscopy, induced sputum, positive pressure ventilation via a face mask, intubation and extubation, airway suctioning carry an increased risk of transmission. Where these procedures are medically necessary, they should be undertaken in a negative pressure room or in a single room with the door closed. Only the minimal number of required staff should be present and they must all wear protective equipment. Entry and exit from the room should be minimized during the procedure and the ventilator should be protected with a high efficiency filter. Closed system suction should be used and disposable items may be used in the patient's room as far as possible. This is to minimize the numbers of items which need to be decontaminated. If aerosol generating procedures are undertaken in the patient's own room, the room should be decontaminated 20 minutes after the procedure has ended. If a different room is used for a procedure, it should be left for 20 minutes then cleaned and disinfected before being put back into use. For the management of children with special cases as febrile neutropenia and suspected COVID-19, children should initially be assessed and tested in the emergency department and not in the wards. Prompt administration of broad-spectrum antibiotics for the management of febrile neutropenia is essential. In the oncology wards, there may be designated specific cubicles for patients with suspected COVID-19. All infectious disease precautions must be followed as for other COVID-19 patients, as well as specific cautions for this special group. This is a child-friendly poster that describes the condition, how the disease progress, how the child is tested so he can be oriented. These are the references that were used in these presentations. Thank you very much for your attendance.